management didn't realize pricing was incorrect. They didn't realize the features needed to be there and they didn't do it. Management's fault is why that company was failing or lagging. And that helped to kind of put the onus on management or on yourself and say, hey, if it's not working, then I need to do it. It's up to me. Welcome, ladies and gentlemen. My guest today is Paul Katzoff, who is the CEO of White Canyon Software. Paul, how are you today? Very good, Anthony. Thanks for having me here on the uh, Strategy and Leadership Podcast. I appreciate the chance to talk with you and, uh, and your viewers. I'm excited to be able to share your story. We were just digging in into a little bit about the niche about your company. So as a way of getting started, why don't you share with us a little bit about White Canyon, about you and your background, and then we'll get into the interview. Sure, happy to. Uh, so I'm the CEO of White Canyon Software. We're a 23-year-old software company. So we've been around since 1998. Uh, we're in the little niche of data erasure, and our main tool is Wipe Drive, and we securely erase IT assets. So phones, laptops, desktops, uh, workstations, servers, SANs, LUNs, you name it, we erase it. And that's kind of the little niche we've been in for a long time. And because of data security issues, uh, data erasure has kind of gained more prominence and it's been a, a good, healthy growth over the last five to six years. It's been really fun here. Cool. And how long have you been with the company? Uh, total 12 years. Um, I left for about a year in the middle. Um, but yeah, I started here back in, uh, in 08 in tech support. And back then, um, I actually got my MBA and I was looking for a job and, and software was is in my mind is the river where everything's going. So I was looking for a software company and they had a tech support position available and it was right after that 07 crash. So it was just, there's just no jobs out there. And so I, I said, all right, let me take a risk. Let me go with White Canyon and see what happens. And it was great. Started off in tech support, uh, moved up to tech support manager after uh, nine or so months. And we started rolling into the enterprise side. So I started helping on the enterprise support side and managing the, the support techs. And that was really fun. Um, kind of, you have this new product and new kind of use coming out and really got into helping basic large customers figure out how they can use our wipe drive product to erase their IT assets. And then also what needs we needed to kind of implement on our side to match their, their environments and their architecture. So that was really fun in the beginning there. Um, after a couple of years there in enterprise support and managing the team, I got a little bored and they asked me if, they, if I wanted to move into sales. And uh, I was a little hesitant. Uh, in my mind, salespeople, in my mind, they're a little, uh, the, the stereotype is that they're kind of greasy, kind of slimy, you know, that sort of thing. And I just didn't really fit with my personality. I didn't think it'd really be that good for me. But I wanted the challenge, so I said yes. I stepped into it, and it was so much fun. I mean, the consultative sale, the the IT software sale, is so different than like used car sales or other type of sales positions out there. And so I really got to dive in and work with customers that just come out of the blue and say, "Hey, we're trying to do this. Do you guys help us? Do you guys do this type of erasure?" And it was really fun to kind of jump in and start talking about their, you know, their IT assets, where they're located, how they want to erase them. Where do they want the reports to shoot out to? What needs to be in the reports? Does this need to you know, fit into the ERP system? Does it need to integrate into their current process? And it really got to be really fun to kind of help every customer figure out that White Drive is a good fit for them. And then like three weeks later, a month later, you get a PO in your inbox out of nowhere. So it was this nice uh, Easter egg surprise of like, hey, here you go. You know, here's your reward for all that work. So it was really fun. Um, I was in sales here for ah, six to seven years, maybe eight years, and I kind of felt like I was managing a sales team after a while, and I kind of felt like I needed to, to see what was out in the real world. You know, White Cane's a great place. I've been here for about 10 years or maybe seven, eight years. Let's see, can't do the numbers. Nine years of the, about the time, and I said, all right, let me hop around, see what else is there. <clears throat> Hopped up to some other software companies, and it was so fun to kind of you know, you take what you've learned and, and your expertise and all of a sudden you're around all these other salespeople and learn how they do their software sales. And you learn their styles, their techniques, their tone, 
everything's pretty much on the phone nowadays with some in-person visits. And it was amazing to be with these great sales reps on the enterprise side and really listen in and go, oh, I can improve that, I can improve this. So I did that for about a, about two years. Um, White Canyon had a executive leadership change. Uh, I had my MBA and I knew the company really well. So they called me up and said, hey, would you like to come back as CEO? And that was about three years ago. I think like everyone else out there, you'd say, yes, I jumped at the chance, um, been here ever since. And for me, uh, my strategy for White Canyon is to kind of take us into the digital age, digital marketing age, um, find the, the watering holes where the IT personnel get their information, kind of broaden our exposure. And my goal overall is to be a, a national brand would be my main goal. But uh, in the meantime, just kind of get those um, the awareness out about our white drive product and go from there. Awesome. Well, that definitely, I mean, that's quite, quite the journey. Uh, I'm sure that <laughs> yeah. there's some people who are considering their MBAs, but early and late stage careers. So I'd be interested to hear about that. But one of the things I wanted to ask you first was how has your perspective changed from like being part of the organization at the air quotes bottom and sure. leadership that perspective on leadership then being sales which in some organizations is sort of like a rogue agent that just does their own thing but under the guise of leadership and then yeah. being at the top and then you know being able to have that leadership like how have your perspectives changed on that um yeah and how does that sort of drive your decision making and overall leadership design? Yeah. great question great question um it's hard because each one is individual to the other right um, in tech support, you're there just to fulfill your tasks. Your bucket fills up with tasks every day, and you're there to empty that bucket and get it down to zero as fast as you can, and as well as you can, and keep it professional. So in tech support, you're just aiming to do that day in, day out. Sales side is kind of a, you're right, it's kind of a loose cannon because no one really knows how efficient a salesperson should be or should a salesperson be closing this dollar amount or this dollar amount unless you've actually been there and been in the trenches, you can kind of guesstimate whether someone's doing a good job or not. So sales was great because you got a chance to interact with the customers, but also you, you do have management requirements. You do have quotas you need to hit. You're trying to, and on your side, you're trying to earn commissions and things like that. Um, so my viewpoint on that point was make, you know, stay professional, make the customer feel warm and fuzzy through the whole process. You know, white drive, white Canyon, we're not a big brand. So the first thing, first issue you have is legitimacy. And so my strategy was to prove legitimacy through our certifications, uh, through our, our current client list. Uh, we have 23 of the fortune 50, 44 of the fortune 100 use white drive. Okay. Those are big numbers, you know, for a small player or fortune 500 or 450, account if they hear that a fortune 50 is using us in their mind it's a kind of a checkbox like okay well they can do what they need to do for that client they'll be able to probably do it for us as well can i just so ask a quick question on that sorry to interrupt yeah. the yeah. You, you sort of mentioned like hey my number one priority was this which was in, improve the legitimacy was that the organizational's priority or did you basically decide that either as a sales function or a sales person Great question. I think it was just as a sales function. That's, you know, in your sales process, you're working with clients. That was the weakness that would come up over and over again with your, with the, the leads I was talking to was, well, who are you guys? You guys are in Utah. Oh, do you outsource all your development to Pakistan? Are you guys just a one man shop with a little, you know, fly by night company? We're going to pay you $20,000 and all of a sudden we never hear from you again. Is your compatibility terrible with hardware? That was that came up over and over again. And I think, you know, that's a reflection of your website, your literature, your certifications. It was all these things that had to improve so that just by looking at our website or talking with us, they felt safe and comfortable from the get go. And and we're in one of those niches of data ratio where it's been around for 30 years, 40 years. I mean, data ratio is nothing new, nothing special. So for us, there's no real brands in it either. So. For the IT guys, it was kind of like a, oh, you know, it's, it's not really a known product, but how can we trust it? And that's what I was doing on my side. That's what I recognized. And I think the, the management supported us on that. They helped us get certifications and things like that once we pointed out the weaknesses. And that helped the traction go. But that was, I think it was from my viewpoint, that was the weakness I saw. 
But I think one of the, if we tie it back to, to strategy and what I see, and again, for all of our listeners is the important, and, and I assert that through that process, Paul, it, it was sort of a, not a turning point because I'm sure it was iterative, but it made a big difference as you were able to build that legitimacy. Is that fair to say? Oh, absolutely. I remember when we got common criteria certification, EAL four plus, which is outside it, which is for a whole bunch of countries, like 27 countries. And uh, EAL four plus was the highest of any data erasure product out there. And once we got that, the selling process was so fast. I mean, we went from having to prove ourselves, you know, kind of, you know, argue that we are good to people just calling up and buying for the next two years, three years. You know what I mean? It was great. To me, it was just like, it was one of those learning moments. Like once you get that legitimacy, all of a sudden IT managers or the decision makers are just ready to, to, to purchase you. That's one of the biggest issues they have is, buying an unknown product, which, which is fair. Yeah. But I just want to highlight the fact that it sounds like if what I hear that you did really well is a, as a function, you brought up that concern weakness, what you hear from the customer brought it to the, you know, leadership got their buy-in and really looked at like, Hey, from a prioritization standpoint, we could just keep hammering the phone, hammering the phone, hammering yeah. the phone, yeah. but really we're like, okay, let's take a step back. Let's assess like what is really getting in the way of us being successful let's address that and like dig deep like let's go boom 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 a yeah. bunch of layers and then that opened up a whole bunch of doors so instead of just being operational you were strategic yeah well it's rough because the cost for that certification was a quarter million dollars and so management had to take a gamble and say okay let's spend a quarter million luckily it doubled our revenue at the time but it's still management's decision to say okay is this going to give that result? Is it? And you have the sales team behind there saying, hey, I think it will, it will, will, we need to do this, let's do this. And it worked out. And How long I can't did say the convincing take? Oh, uh, at least two years, at okay. least two years. And the certification took another year. So it was a good three years of, of still having to argue legitimacy with our clients until that certification was done. So yeah, it's not a quick process but worthwhile. And I think that's one of the things that sometimes you could be short-sighted and say quarter million, like, oh, let's see if we can work around it. And I don't know if that's the case with your organization, but I know me being an entrepreneur, I'm fairly cost conscious. Like, you know, no, no, <laughs> that's my nice way of saying I'm cheap sometimes. they saying, hey, like, do we really need to make this investment? But then sometimes, you know, the only way to get to that next level yes. is by, you got to pay to play kind of thing. You do, you do, and there's, and you look at your competitors in the field, you see what certifications they have because your clients are gonna argue what your competitors have against you. Mm -hmm. And so when you hear that a bunch, I think management can hear that and say, hey, you know what? Our competitor has EAL two plus, you know? And that keeps coming up in arguments. Okay, let's look at getting a certification ourselves. So I think you are driven by the market, by your competitors and by what your leads tell you. And that helps you can to kind of choose what you need to attack and how you need to attack it if you need to. Yeah, absolutely. When we do that strategic planning wise, we look at core competencies, competitive advantage. And that's like the benefit of having the ears in the field because as a CEO, yeah. which is sort of going to prep me for my next question, as a CEO, you're not always in the field. You're not always getting that information. But my question now is, Given that you came up from tech support, which is literally like face to face with the customer in the yep. worst times, moving into sales and CEO, how has that view of the customer, how has that, you know, intrinsic relationship with the customer uh, impacted how you lead the team and how you sort of develop strategy currently without giving um, away your secret sauce? Yeah, yeah, I won't give away. I'll just give a few of the ingredients there. Um, you know, first off, you recognize how hard it is. You recognize how hard it is, how every customer that comes in the door, you don't want to lose them, you know, to, to be out there and just have a, a kind of a pump and dump mentality, bring them on in, sell them, and then not worry about the renewals and recharges or keeping them happy. You are negating almost 50% of your revenue. So right off the bat, my first focus is like, hey, we need to get our renewal rate and our recharge rate up from what it was to almost 100% if possible. That's our goal. If we're at that high 90% range, we could then everything that comes into the bucket isn't going out the, the bottom of the bucket as well. So that was my first focus was like, okay, we gotta take care of our customers, make sure they're happy. And then after that, 
anything that comes in, we know they're being taken care of. So I helped shore that up. We made some really good hires here that are just you know spot on the AM side, and they build those strong relationships and kind of fix you know customers leave for any issue. It could be you know compatibility, it could be technical, it could be a personal personality conflict. You know you want to try and mitigate or limit the ones that you can, which is you know features or things that you can do as far as your dev team go go or your product goes. And then after that, it's, you know, personality, you can switch them to a different AM or something like that. If there's some concern there. So we shored that up first so that the bucket wouldn't let them all out. Now on the CEO side, it's okay. We're going to grow. I want to grow. Everyone wants to grow. How am I going to do that? What's the best way? What have we not done to get growth? And uh, the CEO before me, the CEO the whole time I've, I was here, uh, Bill Glenn, he has a great saying, and I'm sure it's out there. Someone else's quote, I can't give it to Bill. But it was, uh, the definition of insanity is to continue to do the same thing and expect a different result. And that's really where I came from was like, we've always done Google Ads. What else is there? You know, is there other watering holes? Is there other places where I can go out there and have a more direct conversation with our potential clients so that they can come in the door or hear about us where we aren't talked about where these, like I said earlier, water and hole. It's kind of my, been my mentality, mentality on that. I think it's Einstein who said that one. So Is it? I, 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 oh, I think well, Einstein was flattered. quoting Bill. So I'm not it's sure. Bill could be flattered that I ascribed an Einstein <laughs> quote to, to him. <laughs> Uh, well, you know, I mean, I don't know. I wasn't there, right? I wasn't in the room, so I don't know where it came from. Um, so we talked about getting that perspective and understanding, and then, you know, uh, I, what I keep hearing is a, is perspective, like the word perspective on your sales. So the other thing that you mentioned earlier is like shared expertise. So I want to sort of ask two parts and you can pick which one you want. How sure. do you share, what is the process or structure you have internally to share expertise with your team so that they learn and develop and grow? And one of the previous podcasts we did was on a development, continually learning organization. The other sure. is, what do you do as a CEO to continue to develop your leadership capabilities and, and how do you elevate your, your perspectives currently? Sure. So sure. internally or externally? Yeah, two great questions. Um, the first off is the training for the sales team, okay? And training for technical support. It's very easy day in, day out to kind of start negate trainings. You know, if you do a weekly training with your sales team, and what we do is we pull up a phone call and you go through the phone call as a team, whoever the salesperson is that did the phone call, you go through the phone call as a team and we have a little grading sheet and everyone goes through and grades the different points in that call and how they did on it. So what that does is it creates accountability for the sales reps where they go, you know what? I'm probably gonna get my phone call in this training meeting next week or at some point in the future. And if this doesn't look good, I'm gonna get a 67 out of 100. Or you know, on the phone call, I'm gonna ask all the questions. I'm gonna dive in deep with the client. I'm gonna build a relationship with them and friendship and discussion. But at the same time, I'm gonna get out the details of what they're looking for and how they need. And therefore I can help this this call improve. What's very easy in any organization, and I've seen it here as well, is to kind of um, delay those sales training meetings and say, oh, well, let's not have one this week. Oh, you know, we didn't, you know, we, let's just do it once a month. You know, you have to do repeated trainings, ongoing, almost just persistent training. You know, even if it's mundane, if it's mundane, you need to address that and say, okay, why is this mundane? How can we make, improve this and make it better? but you need to schedule those recurring training meetings. Otherwise, your team isn't going to be connecting, they're not going to be improving, and you're not going to notice it. And all of a sudden, you're going to see sales decrease, you're going to see um, expertise decrease, and it's a slow, slow slide, you're not going to be even aware of it. So that's the first danger. And that's, I'd recommend for any company out there, have just a set training schedule and stick to it no matter what. Never delay it. If you're not prepared for it, that's your fault but you show up and you do that training meeting and, and you say, okay, next week I'm going to do a better job, do it, you know, improve my content and go from there. But you've got to do those. Otherwise it's a big weakness, big weakness. Got it. And so what I heard out of that is the accountability is a, is a helpful piece that you've looked to like putting that structure in place. And then also having a checklist and a process. We just talked to Chris Ronzio from Trainual and that's his whole life is checklist process so that everybody has a, a kind of a scorecard that they, 
can measure against each other and then that you actually have something that you can train against. Anything else you want to add about that? No, I, I, sales reps love it. They love, this is, this is when you know you have a, a true sales rep is they love the competition. You know, they love to brag to someone else and be like, hey, I got 96 on that. What did you get on your, your one last week? Oh, I got a 90. Oh, well, you'll get better. You know what I mean? Like that, that good fun banter, you know, sales reps love that. I think some organizations may shy away from scorecards and things like that. I think you're missing the opportunity for your sales reps to really engage and, and have fun with it as well. Yeah. And I, I would say it probably speaks to, well, their culture, but I find salespeople yeah. like to win. Like in addition to being competitive, they want to know the parameters for which winning exists. And yeah. because if they can't win, what the hell are they doing? Because that's what motivates them to be yeah. successful. And some people don't like that. So have you had any challenges with that with people who do not like to have accountability? Like they do not like to be measured against finite things. They just sort oh, of like- of course. Of course, yeah. I mean, we've had sales reps express concerns and things like that. And we talked to them about it and just kind of, you know, lay it out saying, hey, you know, this isn't, you know, we're not going to mock you for your score. We're not going to let you go because you got a 50. That's not the purpose of the scorecard. The scorecard is to hear feedback from your peers on how you did on a phone call. And not every phone call is the same. You're going to have a 50 phone call that's out there. You're going to have a hundred phone call. Those phone calls are out there and yeah, it's going to come apparent and it may be embarrassing for other people to hear it. But at the same time, the purpose for us to do this is to improve it because we want to, excuse me, improve sales for the company. We want to improve where we're going. If you want to be a part of that, this is how we're going to get there. We want you. In, and if it becomes obtrusive, if it becomes offensive, then let me know. If it becomes, um, you know, it becomes negative, then let, let us know, let the management know, and we'll address it. We'll change it so it's not that way. But the purpose of this whole training is to help you go from here to here as a sales rep. And I think every sales rep is okay with that or agrees with that. Yeah, I get that. Um, so you, you talked about the importance of continuous learning. What do you do and what are you doing to develop your continuous learning as a CEO? Yeah, you know, it's as a CEO, it's easy to get siloed. You know, you get managers that give you yeses, you get employees that, that give you yeses. They don't really want to point things out to you. They don't really want to say, hey, this doesn't look good or this, this looks poor or we need to improve this part. So it's very easy as a management team or CEO to kind of get siloed and think everything's going great. And you're, you're looking at the numbers going, oh, well, the numbers aren't going great. What's going on? What, what's, you know, I'm hearing yeses from everyone. I'm hearing we're doing just fine, but what's really the situation? So the continuous learning is that if you're seeing the results not match what you think they should be as a CEO, that's kind of a red flag that you're not improving and doing the continuous learning on your side. You need to step up. You need to, to lead and start being the one that's charging into a new, new technology or you know something new in the industry. It's your job to pick yourself up. Um, as far as resources or locations or sources of, of learning, I mean, blogs, websites, news articles, that's kind of what I rely on. Um, that's kind of the latest and greatest. Podcasts are great. Um, I love podcasts on the kind of management strategy side because you're really learning how other people do that. But as a CEO, you realize even canoe building is very close to software development. And the, what they're learning there is, is applicable. So that's, that's my side on the CEO. That's my spiel on the CEO side. It's very easy to get, get lost behind or not do it. Yeah. Well, I think what I, I really take away from that when I think is an important approach is, you know, the idea between leading and lagging indicators that like the organization success is a function of your ability as a leader Absolutely. to increase Absolutely. your capacity. Absolutely. If you're lagging as a, as an organization, it's your job as a leader to step up and go there. And one of the best things about my MBA, one of the things I learned there is if an organization is not doing well, it's management's fault. Hmm. Always across the board. You know, we would, we would do these case studies and I'd come up and our answer would be like, well, the product wasn't accepted by the, the market or the pricing was too high and it didn't, wasn't successful. And we were constantly taught, no, management was ineffective. Management didn't realize pricing was incorrect. They didn't realize the features needed to be there and they didn't do it. Management's fault is why that company 
was failing or lagging. And that helped to kind of put the onus on management or on yourself and say, hey, if it's not working, then I need to do it. It's up to me. Um, just on that note, when, as a practice, when do you take those reflection moments? Like, do you do strategy offsites? Do you do just like your own reflection time? You go off into the woods in Utah and just, you know, pray for three days or whatever. Sorry, to, you know, non-religious <laughs> thinking. Um, sure, you know, sure. how do you reflect on, hey, is management doing their job? Yeah. Um, well, first, I, you know, we have our board of directors meetings every quarter. So right there, there's a good gauge every quarter of where we're going, where we're doing and how we where we've come from. And so right there as a board, if you have a good board as CEO, they come to you and they say, hey, you guys are doing amazing. What's going on that you're doing amazing? Can you can you really um, put together what you've done over the last six months or a year to make it so that you had an amazing quarter so that we can kind of replicate that? On the, on the switch side or flip side of that is you guys aren't doing well. What's going on? What's happened in the last quarter, in the last six months, or in the last year? Are you losing focus as a CEO? Is your management team losing focus? Are you holding your employees accountable or your managers accountable? Is that what's going on? Is it a slip of accountability? What's going on that's, that's causing a slide in sales or in, in your revenue? So if you have a really good board, that can help you. And then from there, you, for me, I take that information and then I, I internalize it over the next month or so and say, okay, you know, I, I get what they're saying to me. Let me try and investigate and see what I can do better. And that's where, you know, I, you know, you look for podcasts and things like that. But I talk to my management team. I'll be open with them and say, hey, what's going on is, you know, are we being too lax? Are we being uh, too strict? Are we, you know, what's going on? Why aren't we doing this, this, and this? What's why are we getting the results we have? And it's it's kind of an investigation because it's never simple. You know, it's never one or two items. It's usually a, a variety of points that come together that are causing that kind of issues and concerns or or lagging results. Yeah. So I hear you know having the accountability even at your level. So having that board system, having feedback loops, both positive and negative. And one of the things that, you know, especially since you have a sales background, you know, that three, six, 12 month sort of reflection is obviously, you know, if you're not doing calls three months ago uh, and I'm in this saying, yeah. hey, how do I reach out with people? It's like the results you have today is a function of the work that you did over the three to six months prior, not like sure. today's results are going to yeah. pan out tomorrow. Yeah. So having that longer term view. And if, if you start doing it correctly today, start doing your calls today. Day, you're not going to get results tomorrow. You got three months, six months to get those results. So you got to you got to institute those or implement those changes as soon as possible. But even then, you got a long time to go until you're going to see that improvement. In most well, cases, even with the example of the hey, we need to get certified. You know that took three years total, total, and and it was a game changer. And it took a long time. So really making sure that you start building your case early. And sometimes it doesn't happen in one conversation, which we won't, oh. that could probably be a whole different podcast is how you got that change management <laughs> process. Um, just yeah. as we finish up here, Paul, what is the one thing as a leader um, you're like, you haven't solved yet? What is that like big challenge that you're facing with, again, without giving away anything sort of proprietary, sure. what is that big challenge you're facing right now that you see moving forward into 2021 and even into 2022? Um, I think, I think what it is on my side is collaboration and kind of synergy throughout the company. I think that's, that's the challenge in the future is you have salespeople you mentioned earlier, that are kind of like always just, you know, just flying off the handle, selling whatever. And then you have a dev team that has to deliver. And I think one of our challenges, and it's always a challenge for me is to get them both on the same page and say, Hey, you know, if we do this, we make X amount of money. If we do this, this client will be happy. Let's all work together. Yes, it's frustrating. Yes, it's annoying that all of a sudden you get a call saying in two days, you have to develop X, Y, Z feature. Absolutely. We get it. But at the same time, we want the excitement that the sales reps are like, hey, I can sell this and we'll be able to deliver and I can make my client happy. And then I can move on to the next client and the dev team going, hey, we got this, you know, we got this feature request. Let's knock it out, make this customer happy and show them how good we are and go on to the next stage and the next client, the next feature request and things like that. That's kind of my challenge is to kind of get everyone on the same page. Hey, let's, let's be successful together and let's get there together. 
I recommend a strategic planning session for that. Uh, I, know, I know a guy and he actually pre-pandemic, he would travel to Utah, but can't go in there anymore. Um, anyway, um, I shamelessly plug myself on my own podcast. That's good. I like it, Anthony. That's great. I think we can do that. Uh, we do strategic planning services, everybody. Okay, why don't I stop plugging myself? Paul, where can people learn more about uh, White Canyon and get in touch with you? Sure. Whitecanyon.com, wipedrive.com are our websites. Um, if you want to reach out to me directly, Paul Katz off on LinkedIn or at Paul Katz off on Twitter are my handles and love to talk with you and talk about strategy or any questions, please bring them up. We'd love to discuss. I, I don't mind chit chatting about any of this. It's great stuff. I love the whole business and strategy side is amazing. So any conversation is fine with me. Awesome, Paul. And it's cats off, like get the cats off the couch, uh, K-A-T. Oh, K-A-T said O-F-F. -F. Yeah. I had to throw that in there because I liked it so much. Uh, That's good. Paul, thank you for your time today. It's been a blast chatting with you. Thanks, Anthony. I appreciate you having me on the Strategy and Leadership Podcast. Thanks to your viewers for listening, and uh, hopefully we'll talk soon. I appreciate it, Paul. And ladies and gentlemen, if you have somebody who is a sales-inspired leader and is really trying to improve the coordination and continuity of their organization, be sure to send them this podcast. So my name is Anthony Taylor. I'm the managing partner at SME Strategy. Today, my guest was Paul Katzoff, the CEO of White Canyon Software. Appreciate you being here. Be sure to like and subscribe, and we'll see you next time.